please be seated. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the bailiff will give each of you a copy of the final instructions. The copy you receive is your copy. Feel free to make any notes you would like on your copy. Your copy will be shredded at the end of the trial. After each of you receive a copy, I am going to read these instructions to you. Does everyone have a copy. Page 2. It is your duty as a juror to decide this case by applying these jury instructions to the facts as you determine them. You must follow these jury instructions. They are the rules you should use to decide this case. It is your duty to determine what the facts are in the case by determining what actually happened. Determine the facts only from the evidence produced in court. When I say evidence, I mean the testimony of witnesses and the exhibits introduced in court. You should not guess about any fact. You must not be influenced by sympathy or prejudice. You must not be concerned with any opinion that you feel I have about the facts. You, as jurors, are the sole fact. You must not be influenced by sympathy or prejudice. You must not be concerned. Do not pick out one instruction or part of one and ignore the others. As you determine the facts, however, you may find that some instructions no longer apply. You must then consider the instructions that do apply together with the facts as you have determined them. In their opening statements and closing arguments, the lawyers have talked to you about the law and the evidence. What the lawyers said is not evidence, but it may help you to understand the law and the evidence. During the trial, the lawyers are permitted to stipulate that certain evidence exists. This means both sides agree the evidence exists and is to be considered by you during your deliberations at the conclusion of the trial. You are to treat a stipulation as any other evidence. You are free to accept it or reject it, in whole or in part, just as any other evidence. You are to determine what the facts in the case are from the evidence produced in court. If the court sustained an objection to a lawyer's question, you must disregard it and any answer given. Any testimony stricken from the court record must not be considered. The law does not require a defendant to prove innocence. Every defendant is presumed by law to be innocent. You must start with the presumption that the defendant is innocent. The state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. This means the state must prove each element of each charge beyond a reasonable doubt. In civil cases, it is only necessary to prove that a fact is more likely true than not or that its truth is highly probable. In criminal cases such as this, the state's proof must be more powerful than that. It must be beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that leaves you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt. There are very few things in this world that we know with absolute certainty, and in criminal cases, the law does not require proof that overcomes every doubt. If, based on your consideration of the evidence, you are firmly convinced that the defendant is guilty of the crime charged, you must find her guilty. If, on the other hand, you think there is a real possibility she is not guilty, you must give her the benefit of the doubt and find her not guilty. You must not consider any statements made by the defendant to a law enforcement officer unless you determine beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant made the statements voluntarily. A defendant's statement was not voluntary if it resulted from the defendant's will being overcome by a law enforcement officer's use of any sort of violence, coercion, or threats, or by any direct or implied promise, however slight. You must give such weight to the defendant's statement as you feel it deserves under all the circumstances. You must decide whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty by determining what the facts in the case are and applying these jury instructions. You must not consider the possible punishment when deciding on guilt. The state must prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt based on the evidence. 
The defendant is not required to produce evidence of any kind. The decision on whether to produce any evidence is left to the defendant acting with the advice of an attorney. The defendant's decision not to produce any evidence is not evidence of guilt. In deciding the facts of this case, you should consider what testimony to accept and what to reject. You may accept everything a witness says, or part of it, or none of it. In evaluating testimony, you should use the tests for truthfulness that people use in determining matters of importance in everyday life, including such factors as the witness's ability to see or hear or know the things the witness testified to, the quality of the witness's memory, the witness's manner while testifying, <clears throat> whether the witness had any motive, bias, or prejudice, whether the witness was contradicted by anything the witness said or wrote before trial, <clears throat> excuse me, or by other evidence, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony when considered in the light of the other evidence. Consider all of the evidence in the light of reason, common sense, and experience. The state has charged the defendant with certain crimes. A charge is not evidence against the defendant. You must not think that the defendant is guilty just because of a charge. The defendant has pled not guilty. This plea of not guilty means that the state must prove each element of the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. Evidence may be direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is the testimony of a witness who saw, heard, or otherwise sensed an event. Circumstantial evidence is the proof of a fact or facts from which you may infer or find another fact. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence. It is for you to determine the importance to be given to the evidence, regardless of whether it is direct or circumstantial. A witness qualified as an expert by education or experience may state opinions on matters in that witness's field of expertise and may also state reasons for those opinions. Expert opinion testimony should be judged just as any other testimony. You are not bound by it. You may accept it or reject it, in whole or in part, and you should give it as much credibility and weight as you think it deserves, considering the witness's qualifications and experience, the reasons given for the opinions, and all the other evidence in the case. Evidence of other acts has been presented. You may consider these acts only if you find the state has proved by clear and convincing evidence that the defendant committed these acts. You may only consider these acts to establish the defendant's motive, intent, preparation, or plan. You must not consider these acts to determine the defendant's character or character trait or to determine that the defendant acted in conformity with the defendant's character or character trait and therefore committed the charged offense. The testimony of a law enforcement officer is not entitled to any greater or lesser importance or believability merely because of the fact that the witness is a law enforcement officer. You are to consider the testimony of a police officer just as you would the testimony of any other witness. You must evaluate the defendant's testimony the same as any witness's testimony. The state need not prove motive, but you may consider motive or lack of motive in reaching your verdict. Count 1 charges the defendant with first-degree murder. Arizona law recognizes two types of first-degree murder, premeditated murder and felony murder. The state has charged the defendant with both types. The crime of first-degree premeditated murder requires the state to prove the following. Number 1, the defendant caused the death of another person and 2, the defendant intended or knew that she would cause the death of another person, and three, the defendant acted with premeditation. Premeditation means that the defendant intended to kill another human being or knew she would kill another human being, and that, after forming that intent or knowledge, reflected on the decision before killing. It is this reflection, regardless of the length of time in which it occurs, that distinguishes first-degree murder from second-degree murder. While reflection is required for first-degree murder, the time needed for reflection is not necessarily prolonged, and the space of time between the intent or knowledge to kill and the act of killing may be very short. 
an act is not done with premeditation if it is the instant effect of a sudden quarrel or heat of passion. The crime of first-degree premeditated murder includes the lesser offense of second-degree murder. You may consider a lesser offense if either, one, you find the defendant not guilty of first-degree premeditated murder, or two, after full and careful consideration of the facts, you cannot agree on whether to find the defendant guilty or not guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. You cannot find the defendant guilty of any offense unless you find the state has proved each element of that offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The crime of second-degree murder requires proof of one of the following. One, the defendant intentionally caused the death of another person, or two, the defendant caused the death of another person by conduct which the defendant knew would cause death or serious physical injury, or three, under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life, the defendant recklessly engaged in conduct that created a grave risk of death and thereby caused the death of another person. The risk must be such that disregarding it was a gross deviation from what a reasonable person in the defendant's situation would have done. The difference between first-degree murder and second-degree murder is that second-degree murder does not require premeditation by the defendant. If you determine that the defendant is guilty of either first-degree murder or second-degree murder and you have a reasonable doubt as to which it was, you must find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder. If and only if you find the elements of second-degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you must then consider whether the homicide was committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion resulting from adequate provocation by the victim. Adequate provocation means conduct or circumstances sufficient to deprive a reasonable person of self-control. Words alone are not adequate provocation to justify reducing an intentional killing to manslaughter. There must not have been a cooling off period between the provocation and the killing. A cooling off period is the time it would take a reasonable person to regain self-control under the circumstances. If, after finding the elements of second degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you also unanimously find beyond a reasonable doubt that the homicide was not committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion resulting from adequate provocation by the victim, then you must find the defendant guilty of second degree murder. If, after finding the elements of second degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you also unanimously find beyond a reasonable doubt that the homicide was committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion resulting from adequate provocation by the victim, then you must find the defendant not guilty of second-degree murder, but guilty of manslaughter. If you determine that the defendant is guilty of either second-degree murder or manslaughter, but you have a reasonable doubt as to which it was, you must find the defendant guilty of manslaughter. The defendant cannot be guilty of both second-degree murder and manslaughter. As stated earlier, count one also charges the defendant with first-degree felony murder. The crime of first-degree felony murder requires the state to prove the following two things. One, the defendant committed or attempted to commit burglary in the second degree. And two, in the course of and in furtherance of committing burglary in the second degree or immediate flight from it, the defendant caused the death of any person. An attempt requires the state to prove that the defendant intentionally did something which, under the circumstances she believed them to be, was a step in a course of conduct planned to culminate in the commission of the offense. The crime of burglary in the second degree requires proof that the defendant, one, entered or remained unlawfully in or on a residential structure, and two, did so with intent to commit any theft or felony therein. Residential structure means any structure, movable or immovable, permanent or temporary, that is adapted for both human residence and lodging, whether occupied or not. Intentionally or with intent to means with respect to conduct 
I'm sorry, with respect to a result or to conduct described by a statute defining an offense that a person's objective is to cause that result or to engage in that conduct. There are no lesser included offenses for first degree felony murder. In order to find the defendant guilty of count one, it is not necessary that you be unanimous with respect to whether the defendant is guilty of first degree premeditated murder or first degree felony murder. The only requirement is that you be unanimous that the defendant is guilty of first degree murder, which can be either first degree premeditated murder or first degree felony murder. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree murder, you must indicate on the verdict form how many of you have found the defendant guilty of first degree premeditated murder and or first degree felony murder. By way of example only, the jury can be unanimous as to both theories or just one theory or it may be divided. A defendant is justified in using or threatening deadly physical force in self-defense if the following two conditions existed. One, a reasonable person in the situation would have believed that deadly physical force was immediately necessary to protect against another's use or apparent, attempted, or threatened use of unlawful deadly physical force and two, the defendant used or threatened no more deadly physical force than would have appeared necessary to a reasonable person in the situation. A defendant may use deadly physical force in self-defense only to protect against another's use or apparent attempted or threatened use of deadly physical force. Self-defense justifies the use or threat of deadly physical force only while the apparent danger continues and it ends when the apparent danger ends. The force used may not be greater than reasonably necessary to defend against the apparent danger. The use of deadly physical force is justified if a reasonable person in the situation would have reasonably believed that immediate deadly physical danger appeared to be present. Actual danger is not necessary to justify the use of deadly physical force in self-defense. You must decide whether a reasonable person in a similar situation would believe that deadly physical force was immediately necessary to protect against another's use or threatened use of unlawful deadly physical force. You must measure the defendant's belief against what a reasonable person in the situation would have believed. A defendant has no duty to retreat before threatening or using deadly physical force in self-defense if the defendant, one, had a legal right to be in the place where the use or threatened deadly physical force in self-defense occurred and, two, was not engaged in an unlawful act at the time when the use or threatened deadly physical force in self-defense occurred. The state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act with such justification. If the state fails to carry this burden, then you must find the defendant not guilty of the charge. If there have been past acts of domestic violence against the defendant by the victim, the state of mind of a reasonable person shall be determined from the perspective of a reasonable person who has been a victim of those past acts of domestic violence. Domestic violence means any act that is an offense, including assault, aggravated assault, threatening and intimidating, endangerment, sexual assault, or unlawful imprisonment, committed while the victim and perpetrator are in a romantic or sexual relationship. The following factors may be considered in determining whether the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator was or had been a romantic or sexual relationship. A, the type of relation determining whether the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator was or had been a romantic or sexual relationship. A, the type of relationship. B, the length of the relationship. C, the frequency of the interaction between the victim and perpetrator. D, if the relationship has terminated the length of time since the termination. Definitions. 
intentionally intent or intended means that a defendant's objective is to cause that result or to engage in that conduct. Intent may be inferred from all the facts and circumstances disclosed by the evidence. It need not be established exclusively by direct sensory proof. The existence of intent of or belief in the existence of conduct or circumstances constituting an offense. It does not mean that a defendant must have known that the conduct is forbidden by law. If the state is required to prove that the defendant acted knowingly, that requirement is satisfied if the state proves that the defendant acted intentionally. Recklessly or reckless disregard means that a defendant is aware of and consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result will occur or that the circumstance exists. The risk must be such that disregarding it is a gross deviation from what a reasonable person would do in the situation. A person who creates such a risk but is unaware of such risk solely by reason of voluntary intoxication also acts recklessly with respect to such risk. Physical injury means the impairment of physical condition. Serious physical injury includes physical injury which creates a reasonable risk of death or which causes serious and permanent disfigurement, serious impairment of health, or loss or protracted impairment of the function of any bodily organ or limb. Firearm means any loaded or unloaded handgun, pistol, revolver, rifle, shotgun, or other weapon that will expel is designed to expel or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. Firearm does not include a firearm in permanently inoperable condition. Physical force means force used upon or directed toward the body of another person and includes confinement, but, is not, but does not include deadly physical force. Deadly physical force means either one, Force which is used with the purpose of causing death or serious physical injury, or two, force which in the manner of its use is capable of creating a substantial risk of causing death or serious physical injury. Unlawful means contrary to law or where the context so requires not permitted by law. Endangerment. The crime of endangerment requires proof of the following. One, the defendant disregarded a substantial risk that his or her conduct would cause physical injury, and two, the defendant's conduct did in fact create a substantial risk of physical injury. Threatening or intimidating. The crime of threatening or intimidating requires proof that the defendant threatened or intimidated by word or conduct, one, to cause physical injury to another person, or two, to cause serious damage to the property of another person. Assault. The crime of assault requires the proof that the defendant, one, intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly caused a physical injury to another person, or two, intentionally put another person in reasonable apprehension of immediate physical injury, or three, knowingly touched another person with the intent to injure, insult, or provoke that person. Aggravated assault. The crime of aggravated assault requires proof of the following. One, the defendant committed an assault and and two, the assault was aggravated when the defendant caused serious physical injury to another person. The crime of unlawful imprisonment requires proof that the defendant knowingly restrained another person. Restrain means to restrict a person's movements without consent, without legal authority, and in a manner that interferes substantially with such person's liberty by either moving such person from one place to another or by confining such person. Restraint is without consent if it is accomplished by physical force, intimidation, or deception. Sexual assault. The crime of sexual assault requires proof that the defendant, one, intentionally or knowingly engaged in sexual intercourse or oral sexual contact with another person, and two, engaged in the act without the consent of the other person, and three, the defendant knew the act was without the consent of the other person. Oral sexual contact means oral contact with the penis, vulva, or anus. Sexual contact means any direct or indirect touching, fondling, or manipulating of any parts of the genitals, anus, or female breast by any part of the body 
or by any object or causing a person to engage in such contact. Sexual intercourse means penetration into the penis, vulva, or anus by any part of the body or by any object or masturbatory contact with the penis or vulva. Without consent includes any of the following. One, the victim is coerced by the immediate use or threatened use of force against a person or property. Two, the victim is incapable of consent by reason of mental disorder, mental defect, drugs, alcohol, sleep, or any other similar impairment of cognition, and such condition is known or should have reasonably, reasonably been known to the defendant. Mental defect means the victim is unable to comprehend the distinctively sexual nature of the conduct or is incapable, incapable of understanding or exercising the right to refuse to engage in the conduct with another. Three, the victim is intentionally deceived as to the nature of the act. Four, the victim is intentionally deceived to erroneously believe that the person is the victim's spouse. Any notes you may have taken during the trial are not evidence. The only evidence that you are to consider in determining the facts is the testimony of witnesses and exhibits admitted into evidence. Your notes are merely an aid to you for recalling trial testimony and the evidence. The law provides for a jury of 12 persons in a case such as this. As I stated at the beginning of this case, we have more than 12 jurors so that if a juror becomes ill or has a personal emergency, the trial can continue without that juror. In a short time, alternate jurors will de be determined by lot in a drawing held in open court. The alternate jurors are still jurors on this case until they are released by court order. Therefore, alternate jurors will remain under the admonition and available to return if needed. I will read the closing instruction after the attorneys have completed their closing arguments. Mr. Martinez. This uh, individual, the defendant, Jody Ann Arias, killed Travis Alexander. And even after stabbing him over and over again, and even after slashing his throat from ear to ear, and then even after taking a gun and shooting him in the face, she will not let him rest in peace. But now, instead of a gun, instead of a knife, she uses lies. And she uses these lies in court when she testified to stage the scene for you, just like she staged the scene for the police after she killed Mr. Alexander. And this woman who would stage the scene has even attempted to stage the scene through the use of the media. She has courted the media. She has gone on national television. Uh, you've seen the programs and you've seen some of the, uh, her, her words to the media. She has also attempted or gone out in search of the limelight. She has signed a manifesto just in case she becomes famous. And to top it all off, she has indicated that she is innocent, that no jury will convict her, that none of you will convict her after she has staged the scene for you. Well, she is an individual, as you have seen, who has craved the limelight. So it seems that it is only fitting that this individual that has craved the limelight. It is really only fitting that she now bask in a different kind of light, the light of truth. And in the light of truth, you can see who she really is. She's an individual who is manipulative. This is an individual who wants to play the victim, even though there is no abuse, as you heard from those that know her. She's the, an individual that according to her own statements in an email on Valentine's Day of 2007 to Mr. Alexander said that she was destructive. She's the individual that talked about what she did to doors, what she did to windows. And she's in the, an individual that does not appear to be very nice to her mother because she lashes out at her and strikes her physically. Additionally, when the light of truth is shining on her, she is somebody who it's just an individual that manipulates people that, for example, when she's speaking to Mr. Alexander during that fateful May 10th, 2000, 
a conversation that she talks about her sister and says how dumb and stupid her sister is. This is an individual who is manipulative. This is an individual who will stop at nothing and will continue to be manipulative and will lie at every turn and at every occasion that she has. One of the examples is the issue of the gas cans. She indicated to you from the witness stand and looked at each and every one of you after having taken the oath and said, yeah, I bought the gas can, all right, and I brought, bought it from the Salinas Walmart. I did buy it from the Salinas Walmart, but you know, in question, after being questioned by the prosecutor, you know, I took it back and I received cash. Yet, you heard from Amanda Webb, the individual or the woman who works for Walmart, checked each and every single register, even those that were not uh, geared to give refunds, checked each and every single register. And each one of those registers indicated, no, there had been no such refund. And then, of course, you could have the confirmatory action in Salt Lake City after first indicating that, no, I've never been in Salt Lake City. I've never put gas in Salt Lake City. But you saw the receipts that she had. And not only had she put gas into her car in Salt Lake City, she had two other transactions, one for 5.09 gallons of gas and then one for slightly under 10 gallons of gas. She looked at each and every one of you, this person, and attempted to manipulate you. Well, this individual that attempted to manipulate you believes, based on what we've heard, that even though she may have engaged in actions, she may have done certain things, none of it, absolutely none of it, is her fault. Why could it possibly be her fault? If you look back in her history, which is the important part of it, involving her relationship with men, what do you see? Well, even when she was young, she had this personality of manipulating the facts. Back when she was with uh, Bobby Juarez, what did she tell you? Well, this was an individual that was unfaithful to me. How could he be so unfaithful to me after I've done so many good things for him? I've tried to buy him clothing. I've bought him food. I even lived in a trailer that was so bad and it was infested. Never mind that the reason that I moved there was because I was skipping school. No, that wasn't my fault at all. No, no, no. I was doing this for Bobby. And how does he repay me even though it wasn't my fault? Well, you know what? He goes and he talks, to, not talks, he sends letters to another woman over the internet. And it isn't her fault that she found out about it. Of course not. How could it be her fault that she found out about it if the library doesn't have enough security attached to that particular computer to have some sort of device attached to it so that somebody can't come along and just hit that backspace button so that whoever was using it before, maybe one or two or three or four people before that, somebody can just come along and hit that backspace button. It is eerily reminiscent of what she told you happened in February of 2007 where after she and Mr. Alexander began dating, that she went onto his computer and began to hit that same backspace button. It's not her fault that computers have not been improved since the 90s or the 2000s such that you can't stop hitting that backspace button. It's not her fault that that happened, of course not. That's what she told you from the witness stand. And so, according to her, she hits the backspace button, and there it is, this conversation between Bobby Juarez and somebody else. But that's not her fault. But if you remember how aggressively she reacted to that, nobody was going to do anything to her or nobody was going to be putting her or sliding her or putting her in a position of uh, feeling inferior, if you will. She immediately went to Bobby Juarez and did something about it. There is a pattern because the same thing happened with regard to Matthew McCartney the person that she jumped to after she and Bobby Juarez started to have problems. And I do say jump to because when she was dating Bobby Juarez, he moved away to Oregon. And when he moved to Oregon, he started living with a guy by the name of Matthew McCartney. And when this thing soured with Bobby Juarez, she immediately went with Matthew McCartney. And in terms of that relationship, the reason that that broke up 
not her fault, just like it was, wasn't her fault with regard to Bobby Juarez, it wasn't her fault at all that she had these issues with Matthew McCartney. No, How, she can't help it if she is a good worker. She can't help it if she's working as a waitress and people come by when she's working as a waitress and try to tell her things about her boyfriend, Matthew McCartney. She can't help that. That's what she wants you to believe. And again, isn't that reminiscent of what happened involving Mr. Alexander? It seems that this is cyclical, and it seems that the story repeats itself. And it repeats itself because she's lying. And it repeats itself because she's trying to manipulate you through all of the days that she spent talking to you from the witness stand after she had taken an oath. Well, she gets to the point where she moves to Cal uh, Palm Desert in California to be with an individual by the name of Daryl Brewer. And of course, when she's there with Daryl Brewer, it's not her fault, again, that that relationship is souring. No, not at all. The re it's not her fault because, well, Mr. Brewer doesn't want to marry her. What's the girl to do? It's not her fault. She's got to look for another guy. And it appears that he doesn't want to have any kids, and she does. And so, again, it's not her fault. How could it possibly be her fault that somebody has free will? Absolutely not her fault. That's what she tried to tell you. But, resourceful as ever, resourceful as she's always been, this person who is manipulative, she starts looking around for somebody else and decides that perhaps those boys from the Mormon faith are a pretty good catch because those boys, they have a lot of family values. And these boys, they work, they seem to be very successful, they just seem to have everything that she desires in a husband so that she can breathe. And so what she decides to do is to look for one of those boys. And to Travis Alexander's misfortune, he was that boy. And he was that boy back in September of 2006 when he was at this PPL convention, the yearly convention. Yes, he is the individual that went up to her and they began to talk. And such was, or the, the way, such is the way that things began between the two. Yes, he is the individual that went up to her, and they began to talk. And such was, or the, the way, such is the way that things began between the two of them. She wanting to find a boy just like him because she had an ulterior motive. She wanted somebody that was Mormon. She wanted somebody that she could uh, give her a child. And so this seemed like the perfect catch for her. And although she tells you that, well, he kind of was the person that pushed her in this relationship and that he was the individual that somehow was this, or that in the lexicon of the English language, there's a word, it's called no, that you can use when you don't want to do something. And yet you can then take the witness stand, however, and say, well, I do know that word, but just chose not to use it. But it's not her fault. Again, it's not her fault. It's Mr. Alexander's fault for being interested in her, don't you see? Can't you all see, based on those days and days that she was on that witness stand, that it isn't her fault? She was thinking no. Or at least that's what she told you. This person who told you also about the gas cans. Over and over again, she kept saying with regard to each and every single um, repetitious sexual act with regard to each and every one of them, those, no. I was thinking, no. Really, that's exactly what you were thinking. Did you ever communicate that to him? No. This from a woman who is manipulative. This from a woman who pretends to be the victim, even though there is no abuse. And so throughout this early part of the relationship, which some would call the honeymoon portion, during this part, it appears that they do what two people that are young uh, and are involved in a relationship do. They engaged in relations. But there's this finger pointing aspect to this relationship as portrayed by the defendant. Can't point the finger enough at Mr. Alexander. Can't point the finger enough at the fact that, you know, he's a bad Mormon because he's having sex with me. If he's such a bad Mormon, then why stay with him? You're the one that chose him. If he's such a bad guy, why are you hanging out with him? 
And to compound things, well, she's also Mormon too. Why do we, does she keep pointing the finger at him when she is just as Mormon as he is? She converted in November of 2006. And according to Deanna Reed, there are many classes that tell you about the law of chastity. And they tell you about the law involving sexual intercourse. But wait, it's not her fault. How could you possibly think it was her fault when those three or two Mormon missionaries that came over didn't tell her about it? Again, it's not her fault. Although there are all these classes where they talk about it, no. Let's point the finger at Travis Alexander because according to her, he's the bad guy. He's the one that told her that it was okay and so she's going to go along with what he says even though those in the Mormon church are telling her otherwise. It is almost unconscionable for her to point the finger at Mr. Alexander when she's in the same situation as he is. She has the same knowledge that he does. But again, she wants you to feel sympathy. Because again, it's not her fault. But you know, how could it possibly be her fault when she was thinking, no. Well, luckily for Mr. Alexander, I guess, in the beginning, this relationship was from a distance. And I say luckily because at least when she was in Palm Desert, and he was in Mesa, Arizona during that time, at least during that time, she couldn't reach out and stab him. She couldn't reach out and shoot him in the face. She couldn't stalk him. Couldn't come over unannounced. She wasn't living the ten minutes away. At least fortunately during that time, Mr. Alexander had some extra time to live. And during that time, they were not mutually exclusive. So yes, it is appropriate when they are not mutually exclusive for an individual to send text messages to other women if they are male or, or even if they are not. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you see that long finger pointing from the witness stand to him, how could he possibly, when we were together, how could he possibly, before we came, became exclusive, be talking to other women? How could he be on the internet? How could he be sending text messages? But it's okay, don't you see, that when she goes to his memorial service, talking about Travis Alexander's memorial service, after she kills him, it's okay for her to talk to somebody on the airplane to get a telephone number. It's not her fault that this guy was trying to pick her up. Of course it's not her fault. And what's a girl to do after all? The guy that she was involved with up and died after she stabbed him, slit his throat, and shot him. What is she to do? Can't you see that it really isn't her fault? At least that's what she wants you to believe. And during this period, Mr. Alexander did see her. And during this period, Mr. Alexander did engage in sexual contact with her. There's nothing, absolutely nothing important about that as it applies to the killing, other than to try to manipulate you, try to shock you and say, oh my gosh, look at this guy. He wants to kiss her and he wants to do other sexual things that other people do in their private lives. And he doesn't want to talk about it for God's sake. That he doesn't want people to know what it is that they're doing. Why would he want anybody to know what he is doing sexually and with whom? Is that something that this is courteous in this society to do? It's just the opposite. But she has now turned the world sideways for you to look at that in an attempt to manipulate you. Well, they continue on with this relationship and she lives out in Palm Desert. At some point in February of 2007, after this issue involving the February 14th mailing that she indicates that she receives, um, after that they make uh, the relationship, if you will, exclusive. What's interesting about the email from February 14th of 2007, and you saw that, is that not only does it talk about um, her violent tendencies. It does talk at length about that, but it also talks about other things. And you have it there for your review, this February 14th, 2007 email. And one of the things that it doesn't talk about is the package that she supposedly received in the mail that day. Take a look at the time. It's around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. 
I guess they have mail that's really slow there in Palm Desert. Never mentions these unholy underwear, these, these underwear, these Spider-Man underwears that so shocked her. Doesn't mention these chocolates. Thank you for sending those to me. Doesn't thank him at all. The reason she doesn't thank him and the reason that she doesn't mention it is because there was no such delivery. But of course, that's something that can't be verified except that there's this inconsistency. And it starts showing that this individual will make things up. But she forgot. She forgot about that February 14, 2007 email. And you know, sort of the old saying, with the truth, you ain't got to remember nothing. At least you have to give her credit for having an incredible memory. Well, an incredible memory as to the fantasy world that she wants to create for you. Just like that delivery of the underwear. Can't show them to us. Why? Oh, she threw them away. But she took pictures of some other things. And this email was sent out at a time where she would have already received the mail. But after that, she and Mr. Alexander continue on. And they, she comes over later on that in the month of February. And when she comes over in February, one of the things that happens is that she's extremely happy. Or at least that's what she tells you. And she's happy because one of the things that she now knows is that, well, she and Mr. Alexander are together. If she is so happy, if she is somebody that really wants to be accepting, then why, pray tell, does she need to go into his computer and hit that backspace button? That's such, a, oh, such an irritation to her that these computers should have this backspace button. It's not her fault that she can't keep her hands off of this computer. It's really his fault. And it's really his fault because he's alive, he's a breathing human being who has social contact with other people, men and women. And how dare he, when they are not exclusive, how dare he attempt to spend New Year's Eve with somebody. He should really be alone in his house or in some hut somewhere alone. How dare he do that? But it's not her fault that she found that out. At least that's what she wants you to believe. Well, they continue this dating, and they continue both involved in this prepaid legal. But the story doesn't get any better. What we're able to glean or find out from that, the history of it is that it doesn't get any better. And uh, one of the things that starts to happen, according to her, is that she starts feeling something. Of course, her feelings are so important. And rather than talk to Mr. Alexander about it, rather than say, oh, I have these issues, I'm a little concerned, what does she do? Well, they're on vacation. And when they're on vacation, and it depends on the story that she tells, the one to Ryan Burns or the story that she told you from the witness stand, take your pet, because there are many to pick from. But it depends on the story that you believe. During that time, she goes on and she gets a hold of his text messages and goes through all of them, ostensibly while he's either asleep or taking a shower. Take your pet. And while he's doing that, she goes through it and finds some text messages. But it's not her fault. She's not wrong in invading his privacy at all. How can it, she possibly be wrong about invading his privacy when she had feelings? And those feelings confirmed the fact that he was a social human being. That's what in part that she liked about him, that she was very charismatic, that he was very charismatic, that he was very nice, and that people liked him. That's part of the reason why she liked him, but oh no, not when it comes to other people. And she talked about him having sexual rendezvous with these other people. But that's quick, if you will, on the slime and very slow on the facts, very low, low on the facts. You don't have any individual that they could even point to a name. Objection, Your Honor, Bird shifting. All right. There was no name that it was even pointed out that he even had any sexual contact with at that time. But she felt it. So, according to her, that justified it. This person with this borderline personality disorder. And so, as a result of that, she says, that's it. We're going to break up. And we're done with this. Except that, I'm so hurt. I'm so absolutely hurt, she says. You could almost feel it oozing through those, 
fake tears that were supposedly coming from her, uh, from the witness stand. You could almost feel this. And what you could feel, of course, was, yeah, 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 I'm really hurt, except let's go on vacation. Let's go ahead and go on vacation anyway. Even though I know all about this, I'm so hurt that I would rather go on vacation with you and enjoy it. And let's continue going on vacation. Yeah, that's her way of manipulating him. That's a way of not letting go of something that she wants. She wants to curve his free will. And what he doesn't want to do that, well, she's got something else coming for him. She is not going to let him get away that easily. And so she starts engaging in this conduct. So what else does she do? She does what every person who has caught their boyfriend, according to her, being unfaithful, what does she do? She moves close to him. Moves from California to Arizona, specifically to Mesa, very close to him, after they have broken up in the end of June of 2007. That's what she does. Well, now this is when the stalking begins. Well, maybe it was a little bit before that when she's going into his telephone. Or maybe it was before that on the first day that they decided to make this official when she started to go into his computer. There it, is. it is clear from this relationship that there was a stalking behavior from the very beginning. And so, she moves here to Mesa. If they are not dating, if they are ha haven't broken up, why is she here? It's not her fault, don't you know? It's not her fault because he, he's so persuasive. He talked her into coming out here. That's why she came out to Mesa. And it's again, it's this thing that she just can't say no. Just like with whether or not they're going to engage in, in this sexual con conduct. Can't say no. And in this particular case, according to her, and Mr. Alexander's not here to maybe dispute this, according to her, she moved here because he was the one that told her to do that. Even though, according to her, at this point, she had broken up with him. And what does she do when she comes out here? Well, rather than dating, rather than becoming involved in some sort of social scene in the Mormon church or finding friends and that sort of thing. No. Does something else. She begins to be more attentive. That's the word. She begins to be more attentive to Mr. Alexander. Perhaps if she's more attentive to Mr. Alexander, perhaps then he'll want to come back and, and, and have her be the only one. And the way that she's attentive is the way that everybody does it normally. I mean... She goes over to his house unannounced at night, sometime around in August of 2007, and this is what everybody does. And she goes over there and starts peeping in a window to see what it is that he is doing. And he goes over there, and by the light of the television, if you remember, there was this go around by the light. Well, it may have been the light of a television, but now it's the light of truth that we are looking at things. And what she was doing is she was invading his privacy by coming over and peeping in the window. And that is stalking behavior, irrespective of what Alice LaViolette has to say. This individual, Alice LaViolette, who had problems with the truth when she spoke to you about how many times she had testified on behalf of men. This individual who, quite frankly, misrepresented that to you when she was testifying. But according to Alice Laviolette, that was no big deal. Because that's what a person does. She came over and started to look inside. And lo and behold, it's not her fault that she has vision. So she starts looking in there, and lo and behold, there he is. Yes, there he is. And he's kissing another woman. Like that is the end of the world. So what? So what that he's kissing another woman? He's not seeing her. He's entitled to do it. And he's entitled to do it. He's in his house. He has the lights off. It's a romantic evening. Whether she likes it or not, he's moved on. And yes, she says it's his fault. He shouldn't have been courting me. He shouldn't have been continuing to have sex with me. She could have said no. She could have left. She could have moved back to California. She could have never come out here in the first place. She's the person who starts to stalk him. And so she says, oh, I was so upset. And she starts talking about the brazier, whether it was unhooked or not. And we went around and around about that. So what? Well, don't you know he's a Mormon boy? They're not allowed to do that. 
What does she care? Is she the Mormon conscience? Is that what this, what we have going on here? No, she's not anything like that. But she wants to make it seem like it's his fault. She presented it in a way to manipulate your perception because he's trying to take away from him with lies the only thing that he has left. And that's his reputation. He's not here to talk about it. And so it's an easy shot for her. But at this particular point, she's the person that starts to stalk him. And after she starts stalking him, or after this event of stalking, she doesn't leave him alone. No, she comes over the next day. Because she's in the right. They've broken up, and it's okay if you're broken up to come over and peep at your ex-boyfriend's house, and then in peeping, find him doing something, and then wanting to get an explanation. What? possible explanation could he ever have owed her at that point. Oh, and, you know, she didn't write about, that's the first incident of domestic violence, didn't write about that incident of domestic violence, don't you know? Because, well, she's a nice person. And, you know, there's this secret that she's watched, this movie involving the secret, that talks about the law of attraction. And this law of attraction says that you lie. That's exactly what they want you to believe. Now they're starting to justify the lies. It's okay to lie in the journal, which in a sense is saying lie to yourself, because the law of attraction says it's okay to lie. Absolutely okay to lie. You don't put down exactly what's going on, and so you don't write about this. Actually, what's going on here is that she's making it up, and there's no corroboration of any incident whatsoever. And so this relationship, if you will, if you want to call it that, continues. And there are more um, exploitive sexual kinds of things that are presented. And that she, you are regaled with the most intimate details that you could possibly think of. And every time it was, well, I was uncomfortable. But I didn't want to tell him no. It was just uncomfortable. Wait a minute. But she also sent him text messages. And those text messages indicated that she was not uncomfortable. She's the one, and I don't need to repeat it, you remember those text messages, where she's the one that's requesting the sexual acts. She's the one that's saying to him, if you're good, this is what's going to happen, and then I'm going to want something else. So she's the individual that, if we look at the corroborative, the independent evidence that we have. She's the individual that's in, in this as much as he is. There's no indication that he was ever forcing her to do anything, anything at all. But you know, she's attempting to manipulate you by saying, well, yeah, I went along, but I really didn't want to. And with regard to these acts of physical violence, well, they weren't so bad, and I didn't write about them. And with regard to any particular physical act of violence, there's no one that knows about it. There's no one that has seen any bruises. There are no police calls to 911. And she has a reason for that. The reason that she didn't call 911 involving Mr. Alexander is because she had a similar experience with Bobby Juarez. And when she had that similar experience with Bobby Juarez, well, she called 911, and you know what? Those 911 people in, in California, you can't trust them because they talked to Bobby Juarez, and as a result of talking to Bobby Juarez, well, they didn't come out, and so I was so soured by that circumstance that I just never decided to call 911. She's trying to provide a justification as to why there are no 911 calls. The reason there are no 911 calls is because it never happened. Everything in this case points to the fact that it did not happen. There are no medical reports, there are no friends, there is no one that can come in and say anything about that. There are no medical records, there is absolutely nothing to the contrary. What is it that you have? Well, on the day that she, in March of 2008, when she told Mr. Alexander, according to her, that she was leaving, um, he turned around and he hit her. And according to Alice Laviolette, he slapped her, but the defendant went round and round and said, no, it was the back of the head, the side of the head. It depended apparently on her whim as to where he hit her. But if you take a look at the entry for that particular day in March of 2008, 
You know, I told him. He was so upset. And he didn't want me to leave because, you know, we were both so in love with each other, what she writes. And then she says, oh, he kissed me so tenderly three times. There were such wonderful, tender kisses. Is that what she means when she is talking to you about domestic violence? Kissing. See, that's the problem. You didn't get it the first time. Kissing is domestic violence. Tender kissing is domestic violence. But then you bring an apologist like Alice Saviolette and you say, no, 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 no. That's not what it means. You need to go behind this, this diary here. Those words don't mean what they what they, what they say, you need, for example, a little cheat sheet that tells you that under the law of attraction, that's not what it means. Under the law of attraction, it means just the opposite. It means that he did hit her. Can't you read that? Is it, what is wrong with you, almost, is the way it's being put to you, that you can't see that, that you can't buy or can't be manipulated. And the other thing that we have is that she claims that on January 22nd of 2008, there was also this act of domestic violence. And that is not what the act was at this point. Because there's no corroboration involving that act of domestic violence either. All we have is a journal entry of January 24th of 2008. And in that journal entry of January 24th of 2008, she writes, you know, as far as January 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, Nothing noteworthy happened. Not only do we have the diary relating to that, it says nothing happened. But again, you are being asked to take a leap. You are being asked, such as in the gas can example, to think that everybody else is wrong and she's right. And in that example, the one involving the 24th and the supposed incident of domestic violence on the 22nd, domestic violence on the 22nd, you are being asked to say, no, something noteworthy did happen on the 22nd of January. And the thing that was noteworthy on January 22nd of 2008 was that he beat me. And this is the time that I had my hand up. And this is the time that he came after me. But it doesn't say that. Not only is there not any corroborated evidence that can be presented, it's to the contrary. She herself said that it didn't happen. But she wants you to go back and say, well, don't look at what I wrote. Look at this code, this law of attraction. Take a look at that. Combine that with my words. Combine it with what Alice Laviolette says. We'll add that in there. And once you do that, you will be able to see and you will be able to know that, hey, you know what? He did. He did. He, he did abuse me. And right before she leaves in April of 2008, she says that another incident happened. But she doesn't tell anybody about it. She still stays at his home. And off she goes. And what's interesting about these acts of domestic violence is that she was very specific as to four of them. But again, you know, with the truth, it's very hard to keep it straight. With the truth, you ain't got to remember nothing, but if you're not telling the truth, if you're trying or attempting to manipulate, you do have a lot to remember. She forgot that there is a psychologist by the name of Cheryl Carr that has previously been involved in this case and had conducted an evaluation of the defendant. And during that evaluation with the defendant, she gave many, not four, many, 10, 15, 20 incidents of physical violence. Because at that point, physical violence was being used as the predicate, if you will, the seminal act for post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what she was looking at at that time. And so, of course, Let's have a lot of acts of domestic the violence. Facts, not Overall, the jury is directed to recall the evidence presented during the trial. You may continue. And so you now have this lots of acts of domestic violence that she doesn't tell you from the witness stand compared to four that she does tell you. Which one is true? The only evidence that you have indicates that none of it is true because she can't keep it straight. And she's attempting to manipulate the evidence 
to fit the goal that she has at that particular time. With regard to Cheryl Karp at that time, according to uh, Janine DeMarte, one of the things that was going on is that Cheryl Karp found that post-traumatic stress disorder of the defendant involved these acts of domestic violence, these many, many, many acts of domestic violence, not just four. And so now when they want to talk about this in a different vein or a little bit differently, it's not just all these acts, it's only four. And that's the problem with the presentation and her attempt to manipulate you. It's actually not even an attempt to manipulate you. They're lies. That's what they are. And she forgot, perhaps, about speaking to other people and the statements that she made with regard to that. Well, she does move away. And when she does move away, it's almost, if we're talking about light, almost like a ray of sunshine for Mr. Alexander. One can only imagine that his stalker is now far away. Because she had done other things while she was here. One of the things that we know is that she would come over unannounced. One of the other things that she would do is she would get into his accounts. And there's also this incident involving Christmas and being underneath the Christmas tree. There's all these incidents. Perhaps Mr. Alexander can let his guard down at this particular point because he really doesn't have to deal with her on a daily basis. And yes, there is some contact between them on May 10th of 2008. And this is the infamous phone call that involved sex. And actually, that telephone call is very important because you can actually hear how she deals with him. Even though he doesn't know, based on everything that's in the recording, that he's being recorded. She says, no, it was being recorded pursuant to his request, don't you know? Really? Why was it being recorded at his request? He's not going to be, can't listen to it. So what possible benefit is this call going to be for him? If he's recorded, if he's not going to get it, there's absolutely no benefit to him on May 10th of 2008 to have that telephone call recorded. Yes, he said some things on it. But this is a, supposed to be, from his perspective, a private conversation never to be released to anybody between him and this woman that even though she's moved to Wairika, even though they've broken up, even though she's come over and watched him with, other, with another woman, even though all of this has happened, she stopped him. Even though all of that has happened, well, he's going to continue talking to her on the telephone. And he says, and he tells you the reason why. And the reason why is that he enjoys having sexual contact with her. And he gives you the reasons why. And he talks about some specific features that he didn't do before and that he does now. He talks about how she introduced him to certain things. How that was such a good thing. Kind of opened his horizons with regard to that particular aspect. <coughs> and so he's giving her credit for opening his eyes sexually. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with the conversation. What is wrong, or what appears to be wrong, is that one of them is recording it without the knowledge of the other. Objection is based on evidence. Sustained. You'll be able to listen. You've listened to that recording. You can draw your own conclusions as to whether or not you believe he knew or believed that this is something that was being recorded. She says, oh, no, I kept hitting the save button. I was the one that did it. And she kept it. And she kept it all the way from May 10th of 2008. But things were not going so well at that point. And in fact, by May 19th of 2008, just nine days after that, Mr. Alexander is on the computer, this instant messaging service, with somebody named Reagan Housley. And he's talking to her, and he says, I'm extremely afraid of Miss Arias because of her stalking behavior. How prophetic of him, back on May 19th. And this is nine days after this telephone call. But he's extremely afraid of her because of this stalking behavior. Little does he know that he has less than a month to live. And so he is aware of it. He knows that he's in the best position to know what is going on between the two of them because he's the one that's going through it. And so when he makes that comment, that comment is indicative of what is going on. 
you could have people like Alice Laviolette say, it's not true. And the reason when we have to give her credit is that the reason Alice Laviolette knows that is that she can read minds through the past. She can travel back to May 19th of 2008 and know what Mr. Alexander was thinking, don't you know? She's the apologist or the defendant. She's the one that can really set you straight. It's not the defendant that's manipulating you. No, no, no. If you take a look at that statement, Mr. Alexander was making it all up. It wasn't true. He was just saying it. Because, you know, in another part of the instant messaging, they were saying, aha, hi, Jody, read this, or words, whatever it is that they were saying. And so, she, the defendant doesn't want you to pay any attention to that. But that certainly goes, and it's the beginnings of premeditation. Her premeditation to kill him back on May 19th of 2008. He indicates that. I am extremely afraid of the defendant because of her stalking behavior. And who would know better than him? Especially since he's the one that's had to deal with her coming over, peeping in his window. He's the one that's had to deal with her showing up unannounced. He's the one that's had problems or damage to his car, according to Lisa Andrews. And he's the one that has her underneath the Christmas tree and has had ring stole, a ring stolen by her. So he would know that. And so then, what ends up happening is that some time passes. And May 26th shows up. One of the important things about May 26th is that that is the day that they break up. And there's much is made by the defense that, well, during these conversations, he's mean to her. Well, why wouldn't he be mean to her? Yes, there are names that people are being called. That's correct. There are not any nice names. But he is extremely afraid of her stalking behavior on May 26th when those names are called. And there, are, there is anger that is being exchanged back and forth. And he sort of capsulizes it by saying, or using a term that's not quite so sexual, but really capsulizes what's going on here and how the defendant attempts to manipulate the truth. When he says, I am nothing more than a dildo with a heartbeat to you. That's what he tells her. Because that's how he feels. That's how she makes him feel. And yes, he uses all of those other words. But he's also very derogatory about himself. He knows what's going on. Every time that, according to that statement, whenever she wants him, the way that she manipulates him is through sex. Seth made that comment. So, and that comment was on the 26th of May in that instant message. But you don't ignore what else is going on on the 26th of May of 2008. On that prophetic day, he also tells her something else in Exhibit 450. She's apologizing to him. Again, she's manipulating him. She does something and she apologizes and everything is supposed to be okay. But by this time, he has had enough. And he says, I don't want your apology. I want you to understand what I think of you. That's what he's telling her. He's telling her he wants her to understand what it is that he thinks of her. He says, I want you to understand how evil I think you are. At that point, when he's writing that, he is extremely afraid of her because of her stalking behavior. And he does think she's evil. And how prophetic. Look at it, these next words, how absolutely <coughs> prophetic. No one can dispute that that is the truest, those are the truest words that are spoken in this case. And they're spoken by Mr. Alexander, even though he is not here, through his writings. You, Jody Arias, are the worst thing that ever happened to me. Any doubt that that's the truth? Do we need to look at the pictures of his gashed throat? Do we need to look at the sort of frog-like 
state that she left him in, all crumbled up in that shower? Or do we need to look at his face where she put that bullet in his right temple to know that what he says there is true? You are the worst thing that ever happened to me. He's telling her enough is enough. And yes, he's angry. Absolutely angry. After everything that she has done to him. And you've seen the manipulation as she has tried to manipulate you with what she has told you. And the prime example is these gas cans. No one can argue that she lied to you. Well, he's had enough. And yes, he says you are the worst thing that ever happened to me. And then he says, in this exhibit 450, you are a sociopath. No, he does not have a psychology degree. But that certainly expresses a feeling about what she says, what she does, and how she deals with him. How she always is manipulating him. It's teases this anger out of him and tries to mix in the sex and he says, you only cry for yourself. Well, you saw her crying on the witness stand and anybody debate the reason she was crying was because she cries for herself. After all, she never intended to be caught. She said that so herself when, after she lied to the police. Oh no, I was saying it because I did not want to be caught. And so... You only cry for yourself. And then he says, you have never cared out me. Supposedly that could be four. And you have betrayed me worse than any example I could conjure. She has betrayed him. For whatever reason, he believes that she has done something that is, that is absolutely horrific. And he's telling her, I've had it. I'm done with you. And again, this is... May 26th. It's done with her. You are sick and you have scammed him. Again, she has scammed him. Are you going to allow her to scam you? Is really the question from this text message. Are you going to buy her lies? Are you going to believe what she tells you? And so, we get to May 28th, just two days afterwards. Just two short days afterwards, begins to plan, if you will, this killing. And planning takes preparation. And there's no doubt that this woman is a very intelligent woman. And she tries to cover all of her bases. And yes, she could go out and buy a gun. But you know, if you buy a gun, one of the things that she indicated in California was that there was a waiting period and they take your name. According to her, that's something that she knows. Well, let's get a stolen gun. She lives with her grandparents in Wairika and she knows that they have gun, that her grandfather has guns and she knows where he keeps them. So on May 28th of 2008, she starts the planning. She starts the actual steps or begins the actual steps to this journey that will take her to Mesa, Arizona to kill Travis Alexander. There is no other explanation than that she's the one that stole that 25 caliber gun. This very small gun that according to her looks like a toy. This small gun. And on May 28th, at a time when she's living there, there's a burglary that is reported at her grandparents' house. And lo and behold, it's so amazing. And again, this is the manipulative aspect of this case and the defendant. It is so interesting that this burglary of the house is kind of weird. It's kind of strange. It's kind of special. Because these burglars were meticulous. They wanted to leave the impression that this was a burglary throughout the house. So they went to four rooms. And from each of the rooms, only one item was taken. And where the guns were, you saw there was some money there. These burglars didn't want money. They just wanted the gun. And they didn't want any kind of gun. They wanted a special gun, a small gun, because there were rifles there. If a burglar comes in, he's not going to be very discriminating. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm going to take this little gun. 
I don't, don't want to take the money, maybe it'd be too heavy. These other guns are too big. I'm not going to be able to carry them down the street. That's not the way a burglary happens. And oh, after I've taken one item from here, I'm going to go ahead and go to another room. And after looking in this other room, I'm only going to take one item from there. And then I'll take a total of four items. If you're going to do that, if you are a burglar, then why? Why even waste the time of committing a burglary? The only thing that makes sense with regard to the burglary is that the burglar, the person who went in there, is right there. It's Jody Arias. That's the burglar. And she needs a gun. And she needs a gun to kill Travis Alexander. And she gets it. Guess what? Can't be traced. There's this burglary report out there. No one could say it's her. Well, at least not initially, no one could say it's her. But on May 28th, she begins to take these steps after he has told her in that May 26th, 2008 text message that he'd had enough of her. And so what does she do as part of that? Well, she then says, but if I go to Arizona, you know, money is tight, there's an issue with money. One of the things I'm probably going to have to use is my credit card if I go to Arizona, if I fill up with gas. So I've got to make sure that people don't know if I'm going to carry this out, that I'm going to be in Arizona. Because I don't, I can't be linked to Arizona in any way, shape, or form. And certainly using a credit card at a gas station is going to link me to Arizona. And so, well, why didn't I call Daryl Brewer? You, can tell, you could tell from the time that he testified that he still had feelings for her. In fact, when he was asked about this issue, about the gas can, he actually paused, if you remember, and he gulped and he said, oh yeah, she did call me. She called me at the end of May. May 28th is the end of May when this gun is stolen by the defendant from her grandparents' home. Yeah, she did call me then and she told me she was going to Mesa, she was going to Arizona. And Alice LaViolette has the same thing in her notes. That according to Daryl Brewer, the defendant called him at the end of May that she was going to Mesa, Arizona and needed gas cans. And Alice LaViolette, even in her notes, indicated, I thought that this was an unplanned visit. Even in her notes, there are issues. But defendants attempting to manipulate the truth. But there are issues with regard to this because she's telling Daryl Brewer that she's going there. Even her own expert says, mm, there's a little bit of an issue here. There's a problem for me because I thought you said that you were not going to Mesa, that you were going to Utah. Or is Utah just not anything else other than more than a ruse? You can say you're going to Utah. You can have a sexual dalliance, not an extreme one, but a sexual dalliance, dalliance with Ryan Burns, you can adjust him, and nobody will be the wiser. Because nobody will ever know that you were in Arizona, because guess what? You never filled up anyway. You never put gas in the car. Well, okay, that's what she does. She calls Daryl Brewer the end of May, the first part of June, and she gets these two containers two five-gallon uh, cans for gasoline, and they were empty, so it wasn't like they were full. And he lives in the Monterey area, and she leaves on June 2nd. Well, when she leaves, she doesn't take her own car. She decides to rent a car. And she has told you, well, I rented the car out of Redding, California. And the reason that I rented the car out of Redding, California, which is approximately 90 miles south of Wairika, is because Priceline did not m offer this same deal in Wairika. Priceline only offered it in Reading. And that's why I went ahead and did it that way. It wasn't that I didn't want people in Wairika to know what kind of car I was, I was uh, renting, because, heaven forbid, if they knew I was renting this car, they could, it could come back to me. And of course, I didn't want, I don't want to be identified and killed Mr. Alexander, so I've already made provisions for the gas cans, now I've got to make provisions for the car. And so she says, that's the reason why she goes to Redding, California. Except that the documents show something else. Exhibit 523 is the statement from Washington Mutual 
from June 1 of 2008 to June 30 of 2008. And this is the statement that uh, she, the defendant, authenticated on the witness stand. And in fact, what we have here is the budget rent-a-car. You see it, June 9th, budget rent-a-car in Redding, California. That's what we're talking about. But if you also remember, after she killed Mr. Alexander, she came to the uh, memorial, and she flew down here. And if you take a look at down, down here, there it is. See that? She paid $246.99, and that was to Priceline.com, and it says Air. Hmm. This is Priceline. They have to get their act together here. Yeah, yeah, uh, at one point, when it comes down to the flight, yeah, yeah, it, it, they, I pay them, but when it comes to the car, even though I go through Priceline, I gotta pay for the car. And how is Priceline ever gonna get paid if they don't take their money up front for the rental car? That's how it works. They get their money up front. Are you objection or your objection on your list? They get their money up front. And that's how it's listed in these documents so that we know who's getting the money. Otherwise, if it were left to budget, then you're imposing upon budget, if Priceline is involved, another accounting step to then pay Priceline. And it may be a situation where Priceline never pays them. So by this document right here, when the defendant tells you that hmm, the reason I went to Reddit was because of the Priceline connection, she lied to you. Unless, of course, Washington Mutual made this up. Maybe Washington Mutual also subscribes to the law of attraction, and they don't want to put anything negative here. Maybe. It could happen that way, right? That's what they want you to believe. Don't believe what's written down. Believe what I say. That's the same situation here as it is with those diaries. They want you to believe not what the diary said, what she tells you. They don't want you to believe what that document says. They want you to believe what she says. So now we know that she goes to Reading after she's made provisions for the gas cans. She goes to Reading so that people will not recognize her because she is going to kill Travis Alexander. There is no other explanation for making up all these stories that we're talking about here. There is no other explanation. Contacts Daryl Brewer, now has the gas cans, now has the car rented, and still, this car, it's in Reading, where people are not going to know her. And in fact, it's at an airport. By definition, an airport is where people come in and they leave, they're traveling. Those are not the kind of people that you're going to run across at the supermarket. And so it's a way for her to hide. And she shows up there, and Mr. Colombo says to her, I've got this nice little red ditty over here for you. Nice little red car that you could drive on your way to Arizona, or not Arizona, just drive around. And by the way, where are you going to drive? Oh, you know, just around town. That's, that's, that's all I'm going to do. Why did she lie to him? Why did she make that up to him? Because she didn't want to tell him that she was going to Mesa, Arizona, like she had already told Daryl Brewer. Because then again, that would connect her. But why not take the red car? Well, you know, according to her, red cars call the attention of the police. And she certainly doesn't want that. She doesn't want the police to find out about her because she's on a mission. She's on a mission to kill somebody. Why would you take a gun if you are going to go on this trip other than to kill this guy? And she says, oh, you know, I didn't know that I was going to go there, even though I told Daryl Brewer, I didn't know I was going to go there. Keep in mind that this is a rental car. And one of the things that she says as she's pointing the finger at Mr. Alexander and how viciously sexual he is, do you remember when she claimed that she was down in that office? Do you remember she said, we were down in that office and I had brought over some CDs from the trips that we had taken with some photographs. Do you remember that? 
And she said, I had scratched them. For whatever reason, she had scratched those CDs. And he got mad and threw that CD. Because, you know, that guy, he gets mad at everything. And so I then have to have intercourse with him to calm him down. That's what she said. If she's not going to visit him, if she's not going, thinking, or if she hasn't already made up her mind to leave Wairika and visit Mr. Alexander in Mesa, Arizona, why? Why take these CDs of the trip with her? Why take these CDs? Who is she going to show these CDs to him other than him? And she's in a rental car. So that requires a volitional movement on her part to take something from inside the house or her car, whatever, which one, whatever one she does. But it requires a volitional movement to get those CDs into her car and drive down to Redding, California, and then put them in the rental car. There is no other explanation for those CDs to be in Mesa, Arizona, other than that she knew, she absolutely knew, and had already planned it. She knew she was going to kill him. Why else take the CDs? Do you think that Joe Colombo wanted to look at them? Do you think that her family in Redding cared? The ones that she claims took her to the airport. Nobody cares about that. But it's a good way to disarm, if you will. Or it's a good excuse to show up unannounced somewhere. Look, you know, the only reason I'm dropping by, just like I did back in August of 2007, the only reason I dropped by was to show you this. It's not my fault that you haven't seen these, and it's not my fault that I haven't been able to get them to you. Not my fault at all. Not at all. But you know, I'm making it up to you now. She left Wairika, California with those CDs. But she forgot about it as she attempted to manipulate the story from the witness stand. She forgot about it. It's those little details that she forgets. And so she brings those CDs and doesn't want the red car. And the reason she doesn't want the red car because, well, police will see her. Doesn't want to be stopped by police. And it's actually foretelling of what happens later. Because she stopped in West Jordan, Utah by the police for a different reason, but she is stopped by the police. And she's right. A red, according to her mind, a red car is more significant or stopped more prominently or frequently by police. Doesn't want to be stopped. Because what if she stopped in a place that shows that she's going to Mesa? She wants to hide the fact that she's going to Mesa, Arizona. And she want, the only reason to hide that fact is because she's going to kill him. It isn't like the bishop is going to be upset if she shows up in Mesa, Arizona. It's not like her family is going to be upset if she shows up in Mesa, Arizona. They're, she's an adult. It's not like her friends, whoever they may be, because we don't know who they are, they're not going to be upset if she shows up in Mesa, Arizona. The only reason to keep this whole thing a secret which is what she tried to do. It's because she was going to kill them. And she's making preparations. And she's very good at making these preparations. You do have to tip her hat. Your hat to her. First of all, the burglary. She does a burglary. There are no suspects. The only thing, one of the only things to take it is this 25 caliber. It's lost. It's out there. This 25 caliber handgun. Then she rents this car and then takes the white car. And the white car does have some floor mats in it takes this white car and says, I'm only going to drive around here. Again, she lies, makes that up. It's like a field of lies that has sprouted around her as she sat on that witness stand. It's every time she spat something out, another lie, another weed would grow around her. And so she gets in that car, heads out, and sleeps the night at Matthew McCartney's house. And the next morning, June 3rd of 2008, she then shows up over in Monterey, the Monterey area, shows up there in the morning and sees Daryl Brewer. And yes, she now has two gas cans. And the only reason to get these gas cans is to put gas on them. There's no other reason why anybody would get a gas can to go on this trip. Well, the ostensible reason to get these gas cans is perhaps Gas is cheaper in Utah, or maybe gas is cheaper in Nevada than it is in California. 
And that's the one of the reasons that's given. But if gas is cheaper in Nevada or Utah, and she does fill them up in Utah, why then? Why would she fill them up in Pasadena? Why would she fill up these three gas cans in Pasadena? The only reason she would fill these gas cans up in Pasadena is because she was going to take the drive to Mesa. And sure enough, there is no evidence that she ever was in this area through this gas, by purchasing gasoline. Everybody that travels in, if they stop somewhere and use a credit card, it's easy to trace. But not if you don't stop anywhere. And so she picks up these two gas cans and begins the drive. And after she begins this drive, now take a little detour. And this little detour is after some thought because this is a meticulous approach to premeditation. This is a meticulous approach to killing. Again, why stop in Salinas, California at a Walmart to buy another five gallon can? Because she's been thinking and she thinks, you know, 10 gallons, let's say that maybe 30, to 30 miles per gallon, that's only 300 miles, so if we need another five, maybe that gives me another 150 miles, that's 450 miles. That gets me through Arizona and into Nevada. So she stops at the Walmart. And she stops at the Walmart and she does buy a gas can. She admits it. So when you look at this receipt, 237.008, and you look at it, the bottom item there for $12.96 is the gas can. I guess that's the price of premeditation these days. $12.96. And she admitted, yeah, sure did. I'm under some cross-examination. I bought that gas can. But, and she was very specific, I took it back to this same store, 2458, on that same day. Objection, Vexton, I'm never this. You remember what she said on cross-examination when she was asked, where did you take that gas can back? And on cross-examination specifically, she said, I took it back to the same store that I bought it from. Objection, Ms. Caragiorgi's testimony. Overall, the jury is directed to recall the evidence. And do you remember at that time that the question that was followed up was, well, would it surprise you that that store in Salinas doesn't have any record of that? And her answer was, yes, it would surprise me because I got money back. I got a refund. That's the way the exchange went. And your notes should reflect that. So didn't take it back there, did she? But she told you that. Why did she say that? Why did she tell you that? Because that's just crushing, if you will, in terms of whether or not this is premeditated. And it is premeditated. She was coming to Mesa with a gun and a knife. This knife appeared from somewhere, so she had to have brought it up. Knives are not in a bathroom. So she stops there after thinking about it and now has another gas can, which gives her a further range. If we use 30 miles per gallon, we're talking about an extra 450 miles. Well, one of the other things that she does as part of this premeditation or part of what's going on is that you know, if you want to do something like this, it's a good idea that when you show up, that people not recognize you at the place where you're going to commit this murder. And so if you have blonde hair and you saw the photograph of her with the blonde locks and the black dog and how they told you that that's the same color. Do you remember that line of questioning that went on with uh, Ronnie, Dwor Ronnie Dworkin, their expert on, on computers? The question was asked, well, do you think that this hair here with the dog looks the same as the one where she's laid back? Do you remember that line? Like he was some sort of expert on hair color. You don't need anybody to tell you what the hair color was when she was there with the dog. You can see for yourself. You don't need the prosecutor or anybody to tell you. But you do know one thing. You were also shown photographs that were also taken on June 3rd of 2008, about this same time. And you saw the hair color, didn't you? Are you going to believe Mr. Dworkin and the defendant, or are you going to believe your eyes? Maybe the law of attraction tells you that you should believe Mr. Dworkin. Because again, you can't believe the text messages, 
You can't believe what's written down on the receipt and you can't believe what's in her journal because of this law of attraction. Now you can't even believe your own eyes. Because if you do believe your own eyes, you know she's premeditating the murder. She's thinking about killing him. That's all that's required. The state doesn't even need to prove a whole plan such as this. All the state needs to prove is that the defendant thought about it, the killing, before she actually carried it out. And this is an extensive amount of planning days, six days in advance, six to seven days in advance of her killing him, a week or so. And so she stops there, makes more preparations, and now she can freely drive through Mesa with the with these with enough gas so that she doesn't have to stop anywhere. More thinking that goes on. And she tells you, well, I hadn't planned on going there to Arizona. I hadn't even thought about it and but Mr. Alexander, that guy, always guilting me. This is, you know, God, it's just like a bad disease, this guy, always guilting me. You know, I, it's not my fault. That's what you, he's telling me. It ain't my fault. He, I told him I was going to go to Utah, and he was a little bit suspicious about why I was going to Utah, but... Why don't you stop here in Arizona? You can stop here in Arizona. That's what she told you that he said, or that he implied, that he wanted. She kept saying, no, you're going to come up here to see me after your trip in Cancun. It's okay. Well, the problem is, is that it's her word. Do we really know, based on all these lies, that that's what he told her? Or was there just a call? trying to find out what he was doing. Does he have a visitor there? Does he have somebody there? What are his roommates doing? Are they going to be there when I arrive? What is the situation there? Are you going to take it, her word for that? Is there any indication anywhere that Mr. Alexander even knew that she was coming down there? You have her word. You know, in cases that are minor to you, not even important cases, are you going to take her word? And remember, this individual has no problem with telling lies. You've seen throughout this whole trial. Well, she says that she does have this conversation with him. And in fact, the bone records do bear out that there is a conversation. But the content of the conversation is still in doubt. And I only have to point out to the point as far as the May 10th, 2008 conversation, in terms of showing that she has no problems lying on the telephone where she says, well, yeah, I was faking it. And you know what she said she was faking. Even though you heard her squealing like a cat. No, 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 that's, that's just me faking it. And you know why? Because I need two hands. That's why she was faking it. Okay, well, if you can lie on May 10th of 2008 on the telephone to Mr. Alexander... What makes us think that you can't lie about what you and he talked about on June 3rd of 2008? And remember, she's got this history all along, not only of lying outside of the courtroom, but she has sat on the witness stand, a place where you have taken an oath, a place that is sacrosanct in finding the truth, has sat on that witness stand, looked at each and every one of you in the eye, and lied to you, specifically the gas cans, specifically about Priceline. And to another extent, the finger. If you remember, she said, oh, you know, he was starting to kick me, he broke my finger. He didn't get any medical care, but he broke my finger. Or, alternatively, I actually was working at Casa Ramos before I went. And uh, when I was at Casa Ramos, I or Margaritaville, one of the two. You take your pick, because that's what she told Mr. Burns. And either I went up against one of the edges, the metal edges, and it cut me, or alternatively, it was a margarita glass. No, and then she takes the witness stand and says, well, in terms of the damage to the finger, I actually damaged the finger when I was at Mr. Alexander's home on June 4th of 2008, but the glass was that. That's how it happened. What story are you going to believe from this individual? And that's the issue here as to when she tells you something, what are you going to believe? And so 
She leaves that area, and off she goes. Drives to Pasadena. Um, we know that the telephone calls with Mr. Alexander are after that, but she drives to Pasadena. And then something that is so bizarre happens to her. It seems that there's this coincidental horde of skateboarders in Pasadena. That's, what, that's the way the kids are there in Pasadena. They, 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 they go in hordes, these skateboarders. And this horde of skateboarders, well, they carry screwdrivers. That's one of the things. If you're going to be in this horde of, of skateboarders, you have to have a screwdriver. That's what you got to do. Or else you're not allowed in this particular club out in Pasadena. And you can get a strawberry frappuccino or whatever it is that you get at Starbucks when you go there. Be careful, because when you go in to get this strawberry frappuccino, things are going to happen to your license plate if you run across this horde of skateboarders with this screwdriver. And so when she was questioned about that in cross-examination, one of the things that she said was, well, yeah, I was pulling out after stopping there. And I was pulling out and I saw something flat on the ground. And when challenged on that, if you see something flat on the ground, what makes you think that you can go and pick it up? What in, in God's name would ever motivate you to go and pick this up? Especially if you were afraid of this horde of skateboarders in, in Pasadena. Because she did say that she was concerned for her safety. Why even get out of the car? If you don't even know what it is, and if you don't even know that it's related to the car. And she said, I didn't know it was related to car. I didn't know what it was. And she's having problems with the truth there because, remember, she's got, she's got to remember, she remembers that she's got the license plate in the back. That, that she's got to deal with this issue involving the, the uh, license plate in the back and whether or not they're connected. And she says, oh, I don't even know what the license plate was. I didn't even look in the back. When challenged further, she said, oh, wait a minute. No, no. It wasn't flat. It was actually standing up. And I was standing up and I was able to reflect and realize that it was, yeah, it was this. Not square, she corrected the prosecutor, rectangular. Remember that? She, it was rectangular object that she recognized as a license plate. And if you n don't have any suspicion whatsoever that it has anything to do with your car, why then? Why would you even get out of the car and go look when you're scared? to get a license plate. Why would, uh, on God's green earth would you do that? When you're lying, that's when you would do that. That's exactly when you would do that. But she says, oh, you know, I went and got it, and I really couldn't tell the numbers, and I didn't compare it to the back. So now you're a thief. Somebody else's license plate is sitting out there. You don't know it's yours. Potentially, it's, it's not, if it's not yours, it's somebody else's, and they may potentially come back for it. So what are you doing? You're stealing it. You're depriving them of the opportunity to have the front license plate, which is obviously required in the state of California, because this car had two of them. So that's what you're doing then, because she didn't check to see if it corresponded with the one in the back. And the reason that she's having problems with that is because, as you know, in West Jordan, Utah, the one in the back is upside down like somebody took it off and like somebody put it in the back seat of the car when they arrived at Travis Alexander's house so that the car wouldn't be able to be identified to them just like that that's it you know but you can't admit that and that's why she's having problems with this license plate that's out there in this parking lot and she ends that conversation with the prosecutor during cross-examination by saying, oh well, you know, I didn't see numbers or whatever because you know what? I can't see. I needed glasses back then. So I really couldn't see. So I just grabbed it and uh, I, it had bugs on it and so I thought it was mine. So uh, without any regard to whether or not it really is hers, throws it in the back seat of the car. Who does that? No one does that. Making it up. And she's making it up because she got stopped in West Jordan, Utah, and has to explain how it is that the front license plate got into the car. Because this horde of skateboarders from Pasadena, they can't get into her car. So she has to be the one to do it. And the only way that she can say that she's the one to do it is to make up a story. And she made up the story about these skateboarders 
I guess it's this wild board kind of thing where you have to have the screwdriver. They're the ones that did it. And you know she's making that up. She's lying to you about it. And the reason she's lying to you is because in West Jordan, Utah, that license plate was found in her car. So one of the other things that she doesn't... Okay. We can stop. Sess, please be back in the designated area at 1.30. We will start promptly at that time. Please remember the admonition you are excused for lunch. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. We are at recess. <laughs>